Hey everyone, welcome to our bird physiology video. By the end of this video, you'll be able to explain the form and function of all the different bird systems, including integumentary, skeletal, cardiovascular, respiratory, digestive, and nervous systems. So starting with the integumentary system, Birds have feathers. There are the only taxa of vertebrates that have feathers and feathers are actually modified scales. So my little picture is probably covering some of this, but the point of this graphic, you don't need to know the specifics of it, but the same cells in the different taxa of vertebrates are all kind of the base um, for scales, feathers, hairs in mammals, and it's just different proteins that are made to um, direct those cells toward being a scale, a hair, um, or a feather. So feathers are keratinized stratum corneum of the epidermis. The claws and the beak in birds are also keratinized stratum corneum. And if you look at um, it, if you compare the scales of a reptile, so scales of a snake, to the structure of feathers, you see a similarity, right? In the ways they overlap and kind of just the way they look, a lot of similarities there. And then birds do still have scales like reptiles on their feet, and some of them do at the base of their beak. Feathers have multiple functions in birds. First of all, to insulate the body, but also um, they're like resistant and flexible. So they're strong, but also flexible, which is really important for lift in flight. In across different birds, there's different specializations in feathers for in form and color and arrangement. So to, to help birds best suit their environment, feathers, are variable um, across different species. There's different types of feathers. So contour feathers, when you see a contour feather, it's kind of what you think of as a, as a feather. There's a large firm vein. So the vein is kind of the, the midline. And then there's a downy base. Um, there's places on birds that have feathers, and there's actually places that don't. The places that have um, feathers, the tracts of integument that have feathers are called pterilae. And then apteria is where there's bare patches. So there's certain birds that have bare patches all the time. And then there's um, like a brood patch is a place that becomes bare when a female is incubating eggs. The primary feathers are these kind of at the end of the wing that are attached between the wrist and the tip of the, of the um, wing. The secondaries are attached between the wrist and the elbow. And then there's also tertiaries. Retroces are the tail feathers and the coverts are the small feathers that overlay the base of the flight feathers. So these are the flight feathers and then the coverts kind of lay on top of them. The allular feathers are connected to the allula, which is kind of like the thumb of the bird wing. And it, there are three to five flight feathers that attach there and they're really important in the maneuvering in flight. Molting happens usually annually in birds and it's usually related to reproduction. So the post-nuptial molt is after breeding and nesting and before migration. A prenuptial molt is what we see in males that have bright breeding plumage. So they will molt right before breeding to get this nice bright plumage and then um, and then molt again after. Molting is triggered by photo period, so the length of day. This is a bird that's mid-molt, and when they're molting, they look a little bit raggedy. So if you ever see a bird and you think, oh, that might not be, that looks like an unhealthy bird. Sometimes it's just that they're molting. So they're in between um, 
in between plumages and it, and it kind of, yeah, it looks a little raggedy. The skeletal system of birds is specialized for lightness and for strength to facilitate flight, right? They have those thin strutted bones with the air pockets, so they're much lighter. And there are several bones that are fused to increase strength. There are some, um, the hand bones are fused and also some of the um, vertebrae are fused. We'll get to that in a second. The bill or the beak is formed by the elongation of two bones, the premaxillary and dentary bones. A bird's neck is highly flexible. Good example, you think about a swan, right? Really flexible, but all birds have a pretty flexible neck. The sacrum are those fused vertebrae. So several vertebrae are fused to make this really strong kind of um, base for standing on two legs. If you ever see a bird and they're like some ducks or turkeys where their, their legs are, seem so far back, it seems like they would tip over. That sacrum is what allows them to not tip over. It also provides the strength needed for flight. The highly keeled sternum, check that out. Think about your sternum, press on nice and flat, right? Birds have this awesome keeled sternum that allows for all this muscle attachment that's needed for flight. Again, variable beaks and feet are seen across the different species of birds and they're adapted for different functions. The cardiovascular system of birds is highly efficient. They have a four chambered heart, so double circulation um, and total separation of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Bigger birds generally have a slower, smaller heart um, and smaller birds generally have um, a relatively to their body size, bigger, faster heart. So a turkey, not a big flyer, less than 100 beats per minute. Sparrows, 500 beats per minute. Countercurrent exchange, remember we talked about that in fish? It happens in birds too, particularly birds that are in water, cold water. So what happens is blood coming away from the heart in arteries comes down to the feet, enters the water, icy water, and that blood is going to become cold, right? If we sent ice cold blood back to the heart, what do you think that would do to the animal? It wouldn't be good. So instead, those blood vessels in the legs are all intermingled so that the hot blood coming from the heart warms up the cold blood come on away from the feet so that the blood going back to the heart isn't quite so cold. And so that, um, that flowing in opposite directions again is reducing um, some of the energy that would be lost if we sent really cold blood back to the heart. Birds do not have a muscular diaphragm like mammals do. Their lungs are in what's called a pleural cavity, and there's a membrane um, between the pleural cavity that kind of acts as a diaphragm. So it can kind of suck um, air into the lungs when the muscles surrounding it contract to create low pressure, drawing air in. And then a second contraction pulls air into the air sacs. And so air sacs are this awesome adaptation in birds that allows for oxygen to be absorbed, not just on the inhale, but as they inhale and exhale, air is moving lungs to air sacs and, um, and then exhaled. And so they're kind of constantly absorbing oxygen, which is necessary for flight. Flight takes energy, energy takes oxygen. And while in flight, the contraction of the flight muscles automatically sucks air into the lungs. So that's pretty neat. Those air sacs allow for three times the respiratory volume of a similarly sized mammal. The digestive system in birds, no teeth. Remember teeth are heavy. We don't wanna fly with teeth. Instead, birds will swallow some rocks into that gizzard 
and the gizzard grinds up food with the rocks and then they can regurgitate the rocks to fly again. Birds don't, they have a tongue, but it's not muscular. It's like kind of just stiff um, and it has, but it has tactile sensors. So different birds have different kinds of tongues. A woodpecker has a long tongue, like a probing tongue so that they can find insects that they wanna eat but it's not muscular like in a mammal. The crop, um, so as you were coming in, we've got mouth, esophagus. Crop is for storage and especially in grain eating birds, they'll, they have a big crop to store a bunch there. Then we go back to the gizzard where we grind up, birds grind up with stones, their food. Then another important adaptation in birds is the, the cica. Um, back here, there's paired cica um, at the junction of the small and large intestine, and they secrete digestive enzymes. So that's an, an important um, organ in birds to aid in digestion. The nervous system in birds has a reduced olfactory portion. So most birds do not have a great sense of smell but they do have a great sense of sight. So the optic lobes are greatly enlarged and well-developed. Birds have the best vision of all vertebrates. Some birds, the total weight of their eyeballs exceeds the total weight of their brain. Um, sight is used for flying, for foraging, for mate selection, for navigation. Uh, the eye position tells you, like in mammals, whether an individual is predator or prey, right? So eyes in the front, ready to hunt, eyes on the side, eat, run, and hide. But even though something like an owl has those eyes in the front, the binocular vision, owls have special adaptation. They can move that head almost 180 degrees in both directions. So they almost have 360 vision, even though they're, they have binocular vision. Something like a, um, a pigeon has those eyes on the side where they have three, um, like 300 degree vision without even moving their head. So that's pretty neat. So the hearing in birds is, is good. The ears that you see on like a great horned owl, those aren't actually ears, they're just feathers, but they funnel in the sound to, you know, it's um, helps sound, helps bring in sound so that it even improves their, their hearing. The tympanum, whereas on like amphibians, the frogs, you see the tympanum as part of the external ear, the tympanum in birds is part of the inner ear, so you don't see it. But again, very well developed hearing in owls. So they're good at sight and hearing. And some birds can even use echolocation to identify prey. So can you explain the form and function of all of these systems? Might wanna circle back and review some of them if you need to. All right, we're doing trivia today. The bee hummingbird from Cuba is the smallest living bird in the world. What is your guess as to how big it is? Or maybe you know for sure, maybe it's not a guess. How big do you think the bee hummingbird is? You ready? Two inches, six to seven centimeters. How cute is that? Have a good one. I'll see you in class.